Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to avoid using that microphone because I, I speak pretty loud anyways and I hate to be harnessed. Um, anybody have a trouble, any trouble hearing me? Good. Joe, would you please give me like a five minute when we get down to that? Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Rob Dankhouse. I'm the Natural Resource Manager at the Fort Worth Nature Center. We'll talk about the Nature Center a little bit, but in, in a little bit, but at first I, I feel obligated to talk about me. I hate to do that, but it's almost a necessity. I am an invasive species. Um, I am a Yankee. <clears throat> Uh, 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 Larry talked about a sense of place and, and, and everything, and my sense of place is, is northeast Ohio, and it's all about forest. So what the hell am I doing in a prairie conference? It's because I came to Texas 18 years ago, really my first true experience with prairies. And at first, I, I must admit, I, traveling through the state, it was like, I can see too far. And so, like agoraphobia, you know, it was like, wah! And, and I didn't realize <coughs> how I had changed until I'd been here about four or five years, and uh, my brother and I took a trip to Florida. And it was in Louisiana that I realized this when the highway closed in around me, and I started to just kind of get tense that uh, um, everything was creeping in on me, and it was, it was bothering me. So I realized much to my dismay at that time, that I had acquired that prairie taste. And, and it kind of surprised me because I always consider myself like a, a, a wetland guy and a forest guy and all of that. So the prairies are, are something more different for me. But one of the things that really brought me to, to really appreciate the prairies was at the Nature Center we deal with bison. And so that is what led to, to this particular talk about you can handle the truth, that bison are a keystone species in the prairie ecosystem. So, first thing we have to deal with is everybody's fear of bison. They're big, they're bad, they're tough animals. Correct? All those in favor of those statements? Okay. All those that believe that bison are pretty mellow, relaxed, easy to care for uh, prairie managers, that, in my opinion, after 18 years of working with the animals, and I see Tim Frazier in the back who has, I don't know, about a million two years of, of bison experience behind him <coughs> agreeing with that, that you, you got to respect bison, but you can't fear them. How many people work in kind of the urban confines in their prairie systems? Of course you can't consider having bison in your urban prairie, correct? <coughs> Wrong. You got to get over that fear. There's hurdles, but you can do a lot of things. So we're going to talk about bison. We're going to talk about use the Nature Center as a case study uh, uh, for bison management. And of course, we, we've talked about ecological services, ecological health, and, and bison are the original prairie managers. And I think we all can agree that they're a hell of a lot better at it than we are. Agreed? <coughs> Too many times we re realize we have to have herbivores on our prairies and stuff, and we, we hope to have some prairie dogs or other small mammals and things, and we hope that's enough. Or we've got some deer out there, and those are, you know, integral portions of it, <coughs> but they're not the all we have. And historically, we had elk, and maybe you depend on the part of the state you're in, pronghorn. But good chance at some point in time, the prairie you're working with had bison because bison pretty much ranged across the entire country. So Larry addressed the, the uh, uh, diversity of prairies, the need for forbs and things. And, you know, we try to use uh, uh, replicated uh, bison, what we call cows, and uh, um, they tend to, their feeding patterns are different. And we also en end up having to bring in all this hay for them, and we get Johnson grass established and KR blue stem and just all these other problems there. But if you really want that diversity, you need that natural herbivore out there grazing because they fill a lot of different roles. Bison, as all good prairie managers are, transport seeds around. Hopefully they're going the right genotype and such, but they're not moving all that far these days, so uh, they are moving seeds from area to area. At the Nature Center, where we have 210 acres under fence for our bison, 
it covers a lot of different ground. If you look at the soil mosaic of those areas, our pastures, you can see that we have different plant communities and the seeds from one area get moved to another and see what works best and lets nature take its course. Bison are constantly preparing the seed bed. Their feet, their hooves, are designed to cut the soil. You know, we have to go out for our yard, you gotta buy those funky shoes with the spikes and stuff and walk around to aerate it. Bison hooves, every step they take, cuts the soil and allows water infiltration and gas exchange and all these other things to go on in the soil that have to happen. Personally, I believe on the historic prairies, which we didn't really have a brush problem and everybody credits fire, right? I think the bison had a lot to do with our lack of brush on our historic prairies. This particular situation here, we introduced bison into an area they had not been in before, and it had some well-established cedar trees, which they promptly wiped out by rubbing on them and for the insecticidal qualities, I assume, of rubbing on cedar. They weren't consuming it, but they would basically girdle it, and then they killed it. We don't kill cedars. We put bison on it. Habitat diversification, you want that, that mosaic. Bison are always out there looking for new spots to do things. They, uh, uh, this particular one, this is a young bull, he's out uh, uh, establishing a wallow area. And uh, so he has denuded it currently of vegetation. And, but then he, he, he takes care of the fertilization process. He adds nitrogen a lot um, and uh, uh, keeps the brush from coming around in it. And, we have a whole new plant community when they move on. And since we use a, a modified rotation, we move bison out of there and that a plant community will generate right in that wallow area. They also, as all living things, die. And bison, when they die, they actually increase diversity because he's got a gut full of food and uh, a lot of that is seeds that then are fertilized by the decomposing carcass. They're also uh, watered, if you will, from the moisture of the carcass. They're, they're, it's basically a nursery set up where they're protected, and those plants tied into the fur and in the gut will then germinate, and you can find areas where bison have passed away that are slightly different plant communities than the surroundings. So where do you get bison? You know, there is not a bison or us, although Tim Frazier's probably about as close as there is to that. Um, there's a lot of different ways. I love this picture. This is, that's, they're in a water trough. Um, it's kind of like bison karaoke. Um, <coughs> you can purchase bison. Uh, this is actually a, a, a part of the Vermejo Park herd where the Nature Center, we purchased one bison over the years. Um, so uh, uh, it is possible to go out and purchase them. You don't have to go to New Mexico for it because we have an organization known as the Texas Bison Association that you can look on there and they have a trading post of people selling breeding stock and, and uh, young heifers and bulls and such. And uh, there's, there's many ways to acquire bison. So how many people have surplus money to throw into their bison program? Nobody, okay. Um, so you might be looking towards donations, private donations. There is a, a, a trend over the years of people getting into the bison uh, business. They, they may be trying to do it on a business sense. They may be doing it on a hobby, uh, almost to the pet side of things. Uh, this small group, which uh, does not show that there were two cows involved as well, two uh, female bison, uh, was a small uh, landowner in Peaster, Texas, west of Fort Worth that decided that his 10 acres and five bison did not work. And you can tell that was kind of a, <clears throat> wasn't prime graze there. Um, so he turned around and donated them to the Nature Center because he got out of the business. So we acquired those animals. Interestingly enough, in backtracking their history and stuff, we had sold those animals to a guy up here who then sold them to the guy over here and then he gave them back to us. <clears throat> There's also public donations. In this particular case, this is an animal in a, a zoo I won't name, um, that uh, ironically, we also sold to this zoo. Uh, they raised them up for about six years and then gave them back to us. Um, but you can get animals from a variety of sources. 
So the Nature Center is a, a 3,600 plus acre facility located on the West Fork of the Trinity in Northwest Fort Worth. If you weren't at the, the State of the Prairie Conference last year, but are still familiar with uh, uh, Fort Worth geography a little bit, we're the big green blob in the northwest corner of the city, basically taking up all the land from Lake Worth to Eagle Mountain Lake. We have uh, uh, 3,600 plus acres, it's all natural, and we use that in air quotes, native landscape. Uh, the city acquired it way back in 1913 and 14 uh, uh, as a part of the uh, process of building Lake Worth and, and protected it in the name of water quality. It became a nature center beginning in 1964. And I really like this last little factor, one third of all the city of Fort Worth's parkland managed on about 4% of the departmental budget. <clears throat> We do have a mission statement, and this is really important because I, I imagine most of us that, that deal with land management for any kind of facility have a mission statement, and you must run every decision you make through this filter. So in our case, our mission is really long, um, to enhance the quality of life by enrolling and educating our community in the preservation and protection of natural areas while, <coughs> while standing as an example of these same principles and values in North Central Texas. We... <laughs> Um, <laughs> so it is long, I know that, but uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of important things there. And it is, as I said, a filter we run things through. In trying to be, to set examples for the principles of land management in our region, <clears throat> we try to do everything right, we try to do <clears throat> cutting edge type stuff, if possible. Excuse me. So back to bison. There's basically four different types of bison herds you can have. You can have an exhibit herd, i.e. like a zoo situation. Um, and at the Nature Center, our bison are on exhibit. They're an extremely important part of our uh, property because they're a draw. A lot of our visitors come specifically to see the bison. There's a lot of our members who buy annual passes. They buy it so that they can come repeatedly and check on the bison. They want to come when the calves are born in the spring. They want to come and see them um, when the, the fall colors of Texas, you know, brown and green, um, <clears throat> are there. And uh, that was my little Yankee dig, I'm sorry. Um, anyways, it's a really important part to have an exhibit uh, component to it. You also can have a production herd where you're trying to produce calves or meat or hides or, or combination thereof. And while we do uh, produce calves, which we s uh, sell as a surplus, that is not our goal. Uh, if by chance we didn't have any calves, that would not bother us so much from an economic standpoint. It might bother us from, a, is there something wrong biologically going there? But uh, um, we don't consider ourselves a production herd. A conservation herd is all about the species. You know, we all have heard the stories of the, the crossbreeding of bison and, and cattle to create a, a cattle or beefalo. And the goal there, uh, part of it uh, you'll read about conserving the species because you, you got down to such a bottleneck genetically, but also there were goals of trying to raise the quote unquote tame bison or domestic bison, something that would be easy to handle. Uh, that didn't work. And um, you could also be trying to raise or, or create the uh, cattle who were able to do well on native range uh, better than our, our regular cattle breeds, and that didn't work so well either. So we have this pollution of cattle genetics in a lot of our bison. So there's a lot of genetic work done to determine whether a herd or an individual is, is pure. And, and uh, the, the correct way to, to state that pure thing is pure by the current limits of testing technology because it's always getting better, and one of these days your pure animal may pop and be quote unquote polluted. Um, so anyways, a conservation herd is, is uh, developed to maintain the genetics of the quote unquote pure bison. And I'll try not to do that quote unquote anymore. Um, ecological herd, and that's really where we're all at, is having a herd of bison and, and hoping that they can fulfill their ecological niche to uh, play that role in the system as a keystone species. So, when it comes down to it, the Nature Center herd, we are definitely an exhibit herd. 
we have the pure status at this point in time, so we're a conservation herd. And within the limits of our 210 acres, it's really tough to do ecological completely, but I'm going to show you how we use our bison herd to manage areas that aren't within our fences. The early days of bison at the Nature Center is part of the Audubon Master Plan. If you're familiar with the uh, 70s and the, 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 the big growth of, of uh, nature centers of that time, Audubon uh, had a, a master plan committee that would go out and write master plans all over the country. Uh, we were the recipients of one. They had a kind of cookie cutter taste to them, and they all said Nature Center had to have bison, Nature Center had to have elk, or something like that. You need to have a geology exhibit, and we got everything except for the elk, thank God, um, because I really don't want to mess with elk. Uh, 1973, we got our first donation of animals from the Wichita Mountains. Uh, 1.2.0, that's, that's a zoo terminology, that's bulls. Uh, or males, females, and unknowns. Um, and I hate to admit it, you'll see some unknowns up here in a little bit, and that's more poor record keeping than not understanding the difference between males and females. Um, <clears throat> at the time, they were limited to a 45 acre pasture. So we had three animals brought in, put on 45 acres. You generally are trying somewhere in the 10 acres per animal uh, range. So that was great. Had a calf born in 1974 in the spring. So that actually, because it father came from Wichita Mountains, it was actually the genetics of a, of a fourth animal brought in there. Um, so that was a, a bonus. By 1977, we had seven. We had two bulls and, and five uh, cows or heifers. Now, just so you know, this guy isn't shooting at the, well, he is shooting, but it's a dart. Um, because uh, an adult cow died, and we had an orphan calf, and that was the first management of the herd that had to go on, or go, take place. Drought conditions were there, and so it really pushed more management over those years. Uh, all of a sudden, we had more animals than, than they knew what to do with on that particular piece of, of pasture. So in 1978, the first animals had to be removed. Now that was interesting back then because the animals were owned by the city. And if anybody knows how you get rid of surplus property in the city, it's an arduous process. Um, you can't just deaccession. You can't go, well, here's a good home and give them to somebody. Um, it's all got to go out to high bid and things. And back then, wasn't a lot of people out there to, ready to do this. So whoever was going to buy these animals also had to pr provide all the equipment and personnel to catch the doggone things. So uh, they threw up a temporary catch pen, and I'm not sure how they did it, you know, whether it was a, a bewitched wiggle your nose and they all go in there or what, but they managed to, to capture and load out a handful of animals and get it down to a manageable size, which allowed them, the herd to be maintained at 10 or less animals all the way through 1990. So this is where we're really starting to, to, to improve our situation. The Friends of the Nature Center, our support organization, uh, acquired ownership of, basically signed over by the city to the Friends. That opens up the door to not having to deal with the bureaucracy of, of governmental ownership of the animals and allows us to really expand how we do things. We can trade, we can <coughs> purchase and deaccession in any way we choose, um, all those kind of things. And the Friends of the, of the Nature Center provide uh, a, quite su sufficient funding for our needs. Herd totaled in 1997, which is by when I came to the Nature Center, <coughs> 15 animals, two bulls, five cows and heifers, and then eight unknowns. Again, that was record keeping issues, not that we couldn't tell boy from girl. We had 56.5 acres of land under fence for them at that point. We'd added 11 and a half. So, next thing we needed to know how was some permanent infrastructure. So we needed a catch pen, a handling system. And what you see of the, all the green metal here is a purchase system from uh, Powder River, which I don't think produces bison stuff anymore. Still can get cattle equipment, but there are other companies that provide such. This allowed us to increase veterinary care, actually not increase it, start it, because we never actually were able to do it before. Um, we all of a sudden were able to do genetic testing. So we could go into that conservation herd mode and we were pleasantly surprised to find that all of ours were genetically pure. 
<coughs> and we had the ability to capture and load out surplus animals. So we now could actually manage our population. <coughs> Side note, uh, the bison that was in the zoo that didn't look all that happy and good, that's him uh, there. Uh, that was the first time he got put out on grass and he just, uh, it was neat to see. Um, we purchased 154 additional acres in 1999, put, giving us at our, our 210. Um, this was actually across the road from where our previous pastures were, which led to, in 2005, what I call the Great Migration, uh, which was 69 feet. <coughs> it took 36 hours for the bison to move that far. Um, because they had, from 1973 until uh, 2005, actually, um, they had never crossed that, where the gate was. And the road surface was, was un, they, they'd never felt anything like that. So uh, it was an amazing process to watch. And have you seen the commercial where the guy, if it's a car commercial, when he's looking for like the comet, and he goes to the perfect place and he drops his phone and he bends over to get it and the comet goes by and he comes back and he's like, well, I'm not gonna be, it's only gonna come by once every 120 years, I'm in the perfect spot, and he missed it. Um, we all had our backs turned when the <laughs> <laughs> We fenced those 154 acres there into three additional pastures and made sure that we have either natural or artificial water sources on there. We also got our first ever uh, barn, which doesn't sound like much, except if you ever saw what we were working on before, which uh, uh, it was plywood scavenged from old billboards <laughs> tacked onto telephone poles with a pseudo roof on it and things to store hay. Um, it really was a perfect den site for every noxious critter you can imagine. Um, so it didn't do well for our hay, but the new barn gave us a lot of abilities dry hay storage, uh, 300 plus square bales, which we honestly don't use anymore, and 50 round bales, so I actually need to update those numbers. And this is a misnomer, rodent proof. Anybody has anything that's rodent proof, please let me know. Rodent resistant feed storage. <coughs> and uh, uh, equipment and material storage, um, just of all kinds. We also, uh, uh, in with the new land there on the other side of the road, we moved our handling system over and we added to it, built a, a, a fairly substantial, uh, uh, gentle, humane handling system. We finished that in 2005, which actually led to the Great Migration. Uh, gave us the ability to handle more animals, uh, handle multiple herds, because we sometimes split our herds into a breeder herd and a non-breeding herd. We have uh, uh, kind of developed, uh, uh, yeah, just through habit, of uh, uh, our animals. We don't pull our calves, uh, wean them ourselves. We let the cows wean them. And so we leave the calves on the cows that time. And so our cows tend to have uh, uh, a calf every other year rather than every year, which I don't think any female here would, would dispute that it's easier to skip a year every once in a while before you have a kid, um, <clears throat> get a year off. Uh, and we have the ability to hold animals indefinitely using the handling system there because we can quarantine animals now uh, if we bring new animals in or if we're holding them for sale or any of those purposes. Um, and then this is a biggie, mainly for those of us that have to get in there, increase safety for the animals and the people. Uh, after we have a handling uh, uh, experience, first thing we do is we, we Thank, we are thankful for uh, no injured animals and no injured people, and this system really uh, does a lot to uh, uh, promote that kind of safety. So, you got all that infrastructure in place and you got animals out there, well, what are you gonna do? And notice, I, I chose this picture intentionally. You notice that's not naturally prairie there. It's actually a patch of crossed embers forest that uh, uh, they do well in the woods, too. You don't want to have too much of it, you want to have enough grass, but uh, they will do a good job in the forest as well. So, bison management themselves, managing the population. All of that infrastructure gives us the ability to limit or increase reproduction with those breeding and non-breeding herds or keeping the bull out or being able to uh, switch bulls, do all those kind of things. We can, we have not done it yet, 
utilize breeding loans, either receiving an animal in for breeding purposes or, which is actually what I would prefer to do, is to find a recipient for our animals to put them out. So a possible public donation could be that the Nature Center would provide animals to another facility to uh, um, start a herd where we'll maintain ownership, but you get uh, all the ecological benefits of having them and the, the exhibit value of having them while well, we still maintain access to our, the genetics we want. <clears throat> the veterinary management, which by the way I should point out is Dr. Dean Herbel from the Millsap Veterinary Clinic west of Fort Worth. You don't just find a bison vet on every corner. Um, when you find a good one, hold on to them. Um, treat them nice and, and uh, uh, he basically the first bison he ever handled were ours, and he's grown with us and, and vice versa, and it's a wonderful relationship. We count on him a lot. The veterinary work allows us to identify animals. You know, you can ear tag them, big floppy ear tags, which we, don't, we avoid from the uh, exhibit herd standpoint and things like that. We're microchipping, so we can have uh, hard records of our animals. We can give them all their necessary vaccinations and worming and all of those kind of things. And it just gives us a chance to have a, a hands-on contact with each animal at least once a year for that. Obviously we have an odd bison here, the so-called white buffalo. Um, I don't know whether the story made it down here, uh, but a couple years back there was a, this particular animal was exhibited at a uh, convenience store in Dallas. Um, that had some property out behind the, the store. And they also have like Sicilian donkeys and I think llamas and a few other odds and ends. Um, the Native American community uh, were offended by the use of this animal as a sales uh, pitch. And uh, they convinced the owner to donate it to them who they then donated it to us. But uh, um, obviously this is not a pure bison. Um, so uh, it's easy to pick this one out without doing genetics, but uh, we could test all of our animals through the veterinary work, pulling blood, and uh, uh, Dr. James Durr's program at A&M that uh, uh, allows us to tell who is pure and uh, pull those animals out if need be. So p pasture management. Currently we have five pastures totaling 210 acres. Our largest pasture is an 80 acre pasture, which is where our animals are heading to right now because that's our winter pasture. And uh, it's actually Johnson grass, which they do well on for the winter. But uh, the big thing about it is it has no public access. We take them off exhibit for the winter. I call it my vacation I give them, but what it does is it keeps them wild. Just like any other animal that has access to people and people have access to it, all summer long they're giving it apples and carrots and all that stuff and the animal keeps coming closer and closer and closer and becomes a potential hazard to the, the visitor. Um, by putting them out there through the winter, when they come back usually in March and put on exhibit again, they won't go near people. They're the perfect exhibit animal because they're way over there, not going to be uh, near any humans. We also have the rotational grazing plans that are not based on the calendar, but based on vegetation and some form of, uh, of the exhibit needs of our visitors. And we still have plans to add a couple of pastures, uh, uh, totally another t uh, 60 acres. <clears throat> this unfenced areas though, this is a new thing for us that we started, we used to buy hay and it was in 20, uh, uh, 2011 where, no, 2012, where we were, uh, uh, I was on the phone to, all the way to Nebraska trying to find hay. Anybody else trying to find hay back in those years? Looking at 100 bucks a bale plus transportation cost and all this and the semi load was gonna cost me the same as my house. And um, I thought, well, why don't I just buy the equipment to bale my own? We have the ground. And so I wrote a proposal to our friends group and presented it on Saturday morning on a Monday uh, at their board meeting. On a Monday morning, I had a check. And uh, um, so I went to <coughs> this company, SFI here, Small Farms Innovations, and out of Caldwell. They deal with small track owners. 
This is actually a Japanese baler <coughs> produces instead of a five by five or a six by six thousand pound hay bale that you need heavy equipment to move around. These are three by three, weigh three to 500 pounds. You can load them in the back of a John Deere Gator or a mule or something like that. Um, if they roll over you, they're not, they're gonna maybe be a little achy, but you're not gonna be dead. Um, we do a lot of stuff with volunteers, so that's a good thing. Uh, so it's a wonderful thing, plus it's small size, it can work our small pockets of prairie. So because of our bison needs, we're now managing our prairies differently, and on a roughly five-year rotation of three years of baling hay on them, a year of fallow and a year of burning, given all the weather conditions, that's all flexible and such, but this is a whole new thing, and it makes our bison more cost-effective, which have gone from being a cost sink to at least sustainable, if not a revenue generator, when we sell surplus animals. We also, in terms of trying to generate the, the prairies for our hay purposes for the bison, has really helped to expand our burning program that, in conjunction with the city of Fort Worth, finally getting smart and developing a wildland fire brigade, and so we now burn more regularly. And it helps to justify and bring out greater uh, support in our urban setting. It helps take down those urban barriers because you're seeing different values other than just saying, we want to do this purely for ecological value. The more value, because the average city council member doesn't know, doesn't care about ecological value. You frame it and we're training firefighters. <clears throat> we're providing hay for the bison herd, which generates revenue for the nature center so that it doesn't come out of general funds. You put it all together into a nice neat package and all of a sudden people start valuing those bison at a different level. And it becomes much, much easier to manage them. We also have, and Heather in the next presentation is gonna be talking about some of these areas that are old gravel pits that we're reclaiming and uh, uh, here we're planting uh, seed, which those are part of our future bison management program in terms of possibly haying or even turning into pasture. And last but not least, that part of our mission statement about educating and enrolling the community, we do a lot of education based on our uh, bison group. Um, our volunteers, we use volunteers in all facets of, of our program. We also use university students, uh, we have a lot of uh, classes that come out and actually help us with our bison handling expeditions and things like that. And then of course we do public programming. This is actually a, a photo from what we call the bison feeding hay rides, which is one of our most successful experiences that we have. So when you put all that together, handling the truth of bison as a keystone species for prairie conservation, regardless of where you're at, even in an urban setting, is pretty easy to handle. If I have any time, I'd take any questions. There's time for questions, so I've got a few minutes. <laughs> any questions for Rob? And, and try, try and speak up when you ask a question. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering, uh, what, has there been any movement recently of people consuming or eating the bison, like both hunting and you know, buying it at local markets? Um, and if you consider that something good for I, uh, um, much like you cannot be pro-wildlife conservation, and especially given the U.S. history of wildlife conservation and the North American model of wildlife conservation, you have to accept the value of hunting as a part of that. In my mind, <clears throat> in terms of bison, if you do not accept the value of the production side of bison conservation, which these folks, um, yes, they're out to make a buck, but they're taking care of an iconic species. And without that group of individuals who are either putting them out there on a, uh, I'm gonna use the phrase canned hunt, and I don't like that, um, and that doesn't describe all of them, but it's a good generic term to use, that to generate the money for, for conservation of bison or raising them for meat, hides, hair, all those values, we would not have bison today. If, if we had any, they would be the few rich hobbyists. We'd basically be going back to European 1700s. Only the wealthy had access to wildlife. So I, I 
I, I applaud the uh, uh, trend that we've seen develop over the past, say, 20 years of, of bison really becoming more popular in the marketplace. I think it does a lot of good for us. Yes, sir. What kind of fence infrastructure do you need? Uh, I grew up in the Texas Panhandle. I grew up with uh, good nights, hers, and I had to help with that. So um, do you have to, like, really reinforce your exterior fence? You, we, our, our fences, they, they are many, many different forms. Um, the most secure fences are where you know you're going to put the bison under pressure like in their handling system, then you're talking solid wood sides and heavy metal and all that. But some of our outer areas where the bison are just being bison out there, they're pretty low key fencing. And the uh, uh, sturdiest, uh, most prohibitive fencing is actually the ones that are designed to keep people out. We worry about people getting in a lot more than we worry about bison getting out. Somebody else had something. Okay. Tim? Can I help you answer the loose question? Sure. Okay, so what occurs to me, and I'm here, I'm enthralled by the environment and the talks, and, and I've been in my first prairie conference last year. My intent is to not ever miss another one, but I'm a bison guy. And with our current numbers internationally in North America, 340,000, and our international kill limit is in Texas, 70,000. We've got static. I encourage anybody that's really interested in bison to talk to Tim. Um, he is a, a bison guru for the state, um, <clears throat> whether he wants to accept that mantle or not. <laughs> well, yes? One of the, the interesting things, and I would support what you said, um, we have a farmer's market, where we just about literally over here by Rice University, and every Tuesday there's a farmer's market, and there's a guy that comes and sells bison. He's got the dirt, he's got the bait. We're going to have to uh, cut to the next presentation. Uh, we'll start in about two minutes. Again, this is track one, the restoration track. We'll start in about two minutes with the next presentation. So thanks. Thank you, Rob. Thank, thank you. Thank you.